CEO of the Terasaki Institute, just a fascinating uh, organization. I've been reading up on what you're doing, your technology, and your, really your core philosophy uh, about personalized medicine. I thought that was amazing. I wanted to uh, get you on our uh, technology podcast and have you kind of tell us how did you get into this field, uh, what your biggest priorities are, and really tell us more about the Terasaki Institute. Thank you very much, Shahriar. It's a great uh, honor and pleasure to be here. Uh, I, I am super excited about uh, talking about the Institute, but maybe I'll tell you a little bit about um, how I started. I actually grew up in Canada. Uh, obviously, I was born in Iran and we went to Canada when I was young. And uh, I, I started uh, university as a chemical engineer. Now, as a chemical engineer, I didn't know what that was. I was good in chemistry and people said, go to engineering because you can make money. Um, but once I went there, within a few years, I got my first research experience, which was in a lab that was actually doing something really incredible, trying to build tissues for medical applications. So I thought this was the coolest thing because obviously it's so sci-fi and I got hooked um, in my third year of university and I, that was um, over um, 20 something years ago and I've been hooked ever since. So I went um, to Boston, I did my PhD at MIT and then joined the faculty at Harvard University uh, where I stayed for about a dozen years um, and um, went through a lot of um, um, development and um, soul searching. And about uh, four years ago, I came here to Southern California, initially at UCLA. Um, and then I got introduced to the Terasaki family. Now, Terasaki family is a, uh, is a family that uh, made their wealth actually through science and entrepreneurship. The patriarch of the family, um, Dr. Paul Terasaki, who passed away a few years ago, made his fortune um, by developing assays that can be used to match hosts and um, recipients for organ transplantation. So this obviously is um, one of the first applications of personalized medicine because um, you know tissue and um, the person had to match, otherwise they get rejected. And um, also the other thing that I found interesting with his legacy was that he was actually an entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, right from the time I was doing my PhD at MIT, I got really um, interested in this whole concept of uh, translating what we do in, in the laboratory to the real world and really seeing that as the ultimate impact of the work that we're doing. Mm-hmm. So um, trying to kind of build an institute that uh, bridges um, this lab to um, bedside or lab to real world um, application, I think is something that uh, was very keen to me. So I pitched the concept to the family that I'm really excited to, they had a foundation uh, with a um, somewhat sizable endowment. Um, and I told them that, listen, it would be great if we can actually get this to work to help humanity and be able to create a nonprofit research organization that um, solely focuses on developing new um, technologies uh, that can help people, but also not doesn't stop there, but it, it tries to actually push the technologies forward into the real world and uh, bridges this so-called valley of death, which is the big gap that exists between academic research and real world um, applications. Hmm. So that was um, about a couple of years ago. Um, and um, I've been very excited about how everything has turned out since. Um, and it's been a, just a fantastic journey. Wow, thank you. That, that is, sounds like a fantastic journey for 10 lifetimes, but you've lived it in a, in a very young age. So uh, the Terasaki Institute's core mission, you know, personalized medicine uh, that I was reading about, that's, you know, I thought that was amazing. And some of the core priorities uh, and research areas that you are focusing on, could you take us through some of those things, you know, from nutrition to implants to devices? How does that work? What is it? What are those key projects that you're working on? Thank you. Um, so, um, and just to tell you like about my thinking about all of this, I, I think that um, it's really our goal is more than just personalized medicine. I kind of see it as personalized health because I see health 
as something that encompasses both the, um, the, the healing sickness, but also preventing sickness. And so enabling and enhancing wellness. So this is really this uh, circle of sickness and wellness is where we try to operate. And why I got interested in this is that um, actually multiple different reasons. One of them was uh, I read a very interesting statistic that out of the top 10 selling drugs in the US, they only work for about, um, depending on the drug, um, about like let's say 20% of people. So the other people actually don't really get a benefit out of it. Mm. And worse yet, many people have side effects. Right. So this is you know, a very important thing that happens right now, which we don't even uh, really consider. Right. Um, and then the other thing is when you think about a lot of what people are thinking about personalized uh, world, people are just thinking about the data aspect. You basically um, do genetic profiling of different people. You put everything in a big database and hopefully um, relevant information comes out of that. But I think that this is still um, in many ways misses a lot of the things that we can do both as a, um, as a society, but also as, um, as a person who develops technology about how we can help individuals on a, on a personalized way, in a way that the technology can help um, the individual. So let me walk you through some of the different platforms that we have and how I kind of see this relevant to um, helping people. So the, the platform that I'm kind of right now super excited about um, that is not medicine is actually personalized health, mm -hmm. personalized nutrition, right. uh, because it's so important to, for health. And one of the things that um, I've become more and more excited about is at the interface between health and sustainability, because they're very much related. So uh, one of the things recently that I've, you know, that I was um, also fascinated about is how um, there's a huge opportunity to not only disrupt the current way we make food, but also make that healthier for an individual. And specifically, I became interested on um, livestock industry. Mm. So obviously, many of us uh, eat meat and other types of uh, fish. Um, and the effect that it's having on the environment is astronomical. Uh, it's like about 15% uh, of uh, greenhouse gases comes from livestock, which was astronomical to me, uh, antibiotic resistance, you know, arguably all this um, foodborne illnesses, even the current pandemic is because of our close interaction with uh, different types of animals. Mm -hmm. So, um, and a lot of the things that um, are happening here, there's obviously plant-based meats that are, are coming um, but there's still a lot of opportunity to innovate in there and then make them healthier for people. So we've started this new um, initiative on actually taking uh, cells from uh, livestock, being able to, um, in a very natural um, and um, humane way, be able to grow these cells outside, in a, basically in, a, in the same kind of process that people use to make beer or other types of fermented processes, grow these so that we can actually make meat out of them. But not only that, be able to make that meat so it's actually healthy for people as opposed to having lots of um, components that people don't want to eat. Mm -hmm. So this is like one general kind of platform and why I'm excited about it. And um, and then maybe I'll stop there and yeah. then uh, move to other things, yeah. So, I, I mean, we've seen kind of plant-based burgers, you know, <laughs> I'm gonna call it the impossible burger. You go to your local Burger King and it's, it's not real meat, it's, you know, not fake meat, but obviously uh, it's still good for you. I can't tell the difference of taste. Uh, so. Two questions. Does this platform eventually grow to be uh, its own business? Or, uh, and if so, who else is active in this field? Yeah, so definitely this is a, this is gonna, this is right now starting to be a huge business. Um, so I would argue that one of the most um, uh, expanding areas in all of uh, venture capital funding is boot tech and ag tech and the whole this whole concept of cultivated meat 
is, is a big part of it. Um, if, if one follows this space, then you see examples of this moving forward. So like uh, just in December, the first cell-based meat was approved in Singapore. So there's it actually went through the regulatory process and there's like chicken nuggets that are now grown from chicken cells. Um, the, the challenge with all of this is that uh, despite all this activity, the cost of the process is still uh, very expensive. So to get a, um, some of these companies, which are unicorn companies, like literally worth billions of dollars, um, they still have this challenge about um, growing the meat in a way that's uh, scalable and price competitive. And this is, I think, one of the things that the Institute has done, which I'm super excited about, is actually develop the process to be able to make uh, this uh, meat um, alternative in a way that's both rapidly scalable and also cost competitive today, as opposed to hoping for some um, technology innovation so that um, as other companies are hoping, so that it can become um, a cost competitive, they say by 2030 or something like that. So that's um, actually uh, one of the um, things that the Institute is very um, proud of because we're actually doing, develop the technology and we're spinning it out into um, a, a company that's actually gonna try to push this and um, get it approved and hopefully eliminate all the issues with livestock industry, as well as uh, be able to make uh, meat that's healthier for people. Right. So it'll be a transition, just like the electric car, where people need to kind of emotionally let go of the, the real meat industry. And frankly, the, the, uh, the core uh, rust belt of America that are farmers and, and what have you, and what are those industries going to evolve into uh, if it's not the, the cow business. And the, the uh, environmental benefit of reducing, you know, methane emissions <laughs> to the ozone layer by 15%, you know, that's pretty amazing. So you could buy an electric car or have a meatless burger. Uh, but that, those are ways you help the environment. That's kind of, that's interesting how that's right. technology has changed, how we look at the world that we live in. So tell me about the implants because implants and devices, because I, I just find those, uh, technology uh, integration into the human body and how that can improve health, just fascinating. Uh, implants, how does that work? Yeah, so, so that's another uh, really important area. There's a lot of uh, medical implants and in the future, people are thinking that implants, it will be a very integrated part of our, our lives. Obviously, you know, um, companies like Neuralink are already thinking about how do we um, integrate implants into our uh, bodies, our brain, to be able to um, enhance our functionality, right? So one of the challenges, there's a couple of challenges with in implants right now. One of them is that typically implants are made in a way that um, they're just a one size fit all implant. So there's no um, tunability for the differences in um, people. And also there's no real um, way in which um, we can um, have the implant, let's say grow with the person or you know, do, you know, do things that are gonna be relevant lifelong. So one of the things that we're doing for this is to actually try to use different techniques to make uh, like, 3D printing or non-invasive imaging to really understand um, the physiology of where we're gonna put the implant to enhance uh, the functionality of these implants and be able to engineer uh, implants that are tailored to an, a person. And these could be everything from, um, let's say a bone implant that could be tailored to what the defect is to, um, to even things that are more, much more biological, for example, like, tissue replacements that are made from your own cells and your own um, um, uh, basically um, materials that have been grown to make a body part for you. So this um, concept of making these implants uh, a lot more um, um, personalized and at the same time, um, another challenge that many implants have is that they're just made from materials that don't really interact with the body well, they don't have good uh, compatibility. Um, so as material scientists, we also work a lot on making the chemistries of these materials better so that they actually um, can um, integrate with the body 
work with our own immune systems um, so that we can um, make these implants a lot more uh, functional and have a lot less complications. Right. You know, uh, amazing. I was just reading about the contact lenses uh, that you're working on, which sound right out of science fiction. You know, uh, people I think are imagining, oh, great, I don't have to look at my cell phone anymore. I can just put a contact on it. So tell me about the contact lens uh, technology that you're working on. Yeah, so this is actually a project that came um, um, just through some of my own um, interest in integrating um, wearables with uh, and making them smarter and make, integrating it with uh, human body. So obviously there's been a lot of work uh, that's been done. I've, I was a big fan of um, um, some of my colleagues work. For example, a few years ago, there was a Google uh, Glass that right. uh, could interface with the uh, surrounding world. Um, and people have been thinking about um, other sorts of wearables and contact lens is a really interesting one because it's something that many people use, but at the same time, it has a um, lot of area on it that's not really active. The, the part of the contact lens that needs to be clear is very small. And then there's all this uh, additional real, real estate that's not being used. So there's a lot of opportunity to take that real estate and make it more functional. And that could be in different ways. For example, it could be used to deliver drugs in a particular way. It could be used to sense, um, let's say what, what the solution is in the eye and be able to predict um, everything from um, whether the person has uh, a particular infection, like potentially has COVID or whether um, that, um, that there's a high glucose concentration or something, right? So there's a um, lot of capability like that. So we've been actually developing uh, contact lenses with all sorts of different uh, functionality. And we've actually um, worked with some big companies uh, that are very much interested. Their main uh, contact lens manufacturing um, places that are interested in actually making the next generation contact lenses that are just not just passive um, wearables, but are active and that can sense and potentially even deliver um, things based on what the individual needs. Wow. And the eye cavity is the, the best place for this because most people will say, oh my God, that's a sensitive area, but then you can take it out and put it in. That's a lot easier uh, from a, you know, if the unit gets bad or if you want to change it, right? There's uh, ease of transfer. Yeah. yeah. You know, the, the good thing about the eye um, is that uh, people are already comfortable with contact lenses, right? So that, that actually self-administration is, um, is already done. Um, and if you can make something that uh, the, um, the contact lens is the smart element that can sense and be able to react to something, then in that sense, you uh, eliminate a lot of things like um, having to have a, a doctor actually physically present to administer like a shot or, or something like that. So in some ways, actually, it may reduce a healthcare cost. And also it's, it's, a, it's a membrane that is, um, um, it's actually has the ability to, to, uh, to interact with other parts of the body. Um, and it's not as, um, as impermeable as let's say your skin. Uh, which is kind of has other challenges for delivering drugs or being able to send things from it. So, but, so it's a really interesting modality. Right, right. You know, uh, the last uh, question on the personalized list that I have is transplants. We talked about implants, but what kind of work are you doing on transplants? I, yeah, that's a great question as well. And obviously the whole legacy of the Institute is on transplants and being able to make innovations um, in that area. Um, there's a few different things that the Institute is doing on transplants. One is um, we actually have a big program on transplant um, education and figure out ways in which uh, uh, people can match um, with other people. So there's actually now pro programs in which it's almost like a daisy chain. So you have someone who can donate to someone else and then that other person donates to someone else. And so you can actually get uh, this um, chain of donors so that you can find the donation faster. And, and instead of you um, um, trying to find a match, you can you know, have someone donate an organ to a different person that is a match and then be able to kind of create a chain that way. So that's like one example right. of the kinds of uh, things that are happening in that area. And then the other one is really the fundamental 
uh, biology aspect of transplantation. So we have scientists who are experts, immunologists, and they basically work on trying to understand, but be able to also develop approaches in which uh, we can um, uh, make um, other types of organs compatible with, with a person's own immune system. So these are um, some interesting work that's, that's happening at the Institute, but, uh, but I am um, very confident that in the future, we may actually be able to eliminate the need for transplants altogether as we get better and better in building uh, tissues and using the person's own uh, cells like stem cells and be able to um, uh, manipulate them to be able to generate the transplants. Wow, I think that's, I mean, I think you, we say personalized medicine, but I think you corrected me as personal health. But when you add to it, it's really making the world a better place because all of those concerns are failing bodies uh, and being able to use technology and biomaterials and uh, implants and transplants to help uh, our overall health, I think just makes the world a better place. Um, anything on your agenda for the next, you know, what are your goals for the next five years for Terasaki? What do you think, you, what do you want to see the organization grow into? Uh, great question. And something that um, I've, I've been thinking a lot about because I, as I kind of move forward um, with the Institute and try to develop it, I want to have a very clear vision. Right now, um, um, we're trying to grow to a size that is going to be a critical mass. We recently purchased a building in Woodland Hills, um, a nice 50,000 square feet building that's going to be added to our existing 50,000 square foot, foot, uh, feet foot, footprint. So um, what uh, I envision us doing is I want us to become the world's best place for academic entrepreneurs. Um, I want, um, you know, I do see a lot of challenges with being an academic entrepreneur at um, universities and other types of nonprofit organizations, because typically institutions um, try to just um, make things in a way that um, it's, it's um, you know, maybe it's just very conservative, but makes it difficult for entrepreneurs to um, develop a technology let's say at, uh, at their labs, and then be able to be involved in this development to the real world application through the process. So you typically have to, at some point, um, let it go um, and hope that it's in good hands um, so that it can actually do something. And sometimes it happens, but other times, you know, um, the team that takes it over obviously doesn't have the same passion as the initial team that developed it. So, so having um, the ability to kind of, um, uh, create an ecosystem where the founders of the technology and inventors can be become part of the team um, that pushes it forward and at the same time be able to go um, almost interchangeably between industry and academia um, in enabling this translational process I think is something that hasn't been done in many places properly so I think that's kind of one of the opportunities that we have at the institute to try to do and um, and really put Southern California in the map when it comes to this new model of trying to have um, um, academicians who actually have this entrepreneurial mindset and try to bring the entire ecosystem, everything from uh, uh, funding uh, sources to early team members, um, to um, facilities and incubators and other types of um, things that one needs to get a company off the ground, uh, create an ecosystem to do all of that. And that's really, I think, would be a great contribution. Right, that is, uh, that sounds fantastic. I, I talk with a lot of uh, entrepreneurs that got their start in academia uh, or they partnered with a, an academic idea and then they took it to the next level. But having, as you said, the world's best place for academic entrepreneurs sounds like an amazing uh, working experiment that will yield uh, direct results. So I think that's uh, you know fantastic. Uh, Dr. Ali uh, Khadim Hosseini, thank you so much for joining us on our podcast. Please keep in touch as you develop new programs or new uh, inventions. We want to hear back from you. Um, I think what you're doing is amazing and I wish you great success. Thank you very much, Shahir, and I definitely will do that. Thank you. Thank you.